Okay, well, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much to uh, Nani and the whole Nanoterra uh, project for inviting me here. It's, uh, it's an honor, actually, to be here. It's been, uh, uh, I graduated here in 97, so it's been 17 years. And uh, uh, this building uh, wasn't here when I actually uh, graduated. There was nothing, essentially, here. And uh, uh, so it's really, uh, really an honor for me to, to come here and give a talk in my alma mater. So I, uh, I will be talking today about uh, um, a new form or a new paradigm of computing that uh, uh, we call MEM computing, computing with and in memory. And I hope uh, uh, um, I will be able to explain to you, uh, hopefully in simple terms, something that is actually uh, um, a little bit uh, uh, mathematical, but I won't uh, go too much into the details. You will see a lot of names uh, uh, later, but the main two uh, players are my uh, two postdocs that uh, were with me, uh, Yuri Pershing, who's now a professor in South Carolina, and Fabio Traversa, who's affiliated with uh, the Politecnico of Torino, uh, although he's looking for a job now. And uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, uh, there are three uh, main papers. So one is uh, actually an invited uh, commentary in Nature Physics that we uh, uh, got invited to write last year. And then uh, one nanotechnology will come out soon. And this archive paper, which is actually uh, pretty new, where we've been able to formalize uh, this concept uh, in uh, mathematical terms. So uh, I will give you a motivation of why we uh, got into uh, um, mem computing, computing with memories. And then uh, I will try to uh, show you that, in fact, uh, this is a paradigm that tries to emulate uh, the brain's uh, computational abilities, so how we actually compute uh, uh, ourselves. And then I will introduce the concept of uh, universal mem computing machines, uh, uh, which is a totally different type of paradigm compared to the Turing machines uh, that underlie uh, these type of uh, computers, so, so the von Neumann type of architectures. Then I'll give you a couple of practical examples to show you that actually this technology is uh, something real, can be made actually uh, right now in a lab. Um, I don't want to uh, offend anybody, but it's not quantum computing, okay? So it's uh, something that actually can be realized right now. And then I will tell you what's next. In fact, uh, an interesting uh, thing about uh, mem computing is that uh, it will give us, I think, uh, a lot of information on on the brain itself, so uh, how we actually operate. And that's, that's the goal, in fact, and not only uh, uh, the ability to compute in a massive parallel way uh, on the memory, but also what do we learn out of it in terms of the brain itself. So uh, let me start with the motivation. And uh, some of you may, uh, may know that uh, uh, our computers nowadays are based on a paradigm that was introduced a long time ago, in 1936, by a famous uh, mathematician, uh, Alan Turing. And uh, uh, without going into too much details, uh, uh, it's a simply an object, uh, uh, the machine that he invented uh, that is now called the universal Turing machine, is an object uh, that operates on a tape. So you have a tape and you have uh, a tape head, and you tell the, uh, the you assign the, um, something, some operations, and you tell the tape to do some operations, uh, tape had to do operations on the tape and go either left, right, or stay there. So this is the type of uh, machine that was invented uh, a long time ago. And as I said, uh, it is the uh, basis upon which we actually build our own uh, computers. Now, this is the, uh, the wording. Uh, clearly, it, will, it was formalized mathemat mathematically. I won't go into the details, uh, but you actually have a way to uh, uh, write down this machine in the mathematical terms. And, uh, and mathematicians actually have created an entire field called the complexity theory that tells that uh, essentially studies how fast uh, you can actually solve certain types of problems. And in fact, uh, uh, the most difficult problems are called uh, uh, NP uh, hard and uh, subclass of that NP complete and so forth. But uh, uh, given this, uh, this uh, uh, mathematical definition, how do we actually implement it in practice? So how do we actually create a computers like this? Well, we actually do something uh, that, uh, uh, in simple terms, uh, okay, uses uh, two main concepts. Uh, so you have uh, a CPU, which uh, has a control unit that tells the computer uh, what type of uh, program to do, and, and it has also an arithmetic logic unit that does all, all sorts of uh, operations. And then there is a uh, memory, 
And the most important thing I would like you to remember is that the memory and the CPU are physically separate. So you have a CPU on one side and uh, uh, the, uh, the memory on the other side. Now you can do also uh, a massively uh, parallel computing with these things, but it doesn't um, change much the architecture because you have the CPUs with their own memories and then they have to communicate with each other to actually solve the problem. And clearly you have an input and then an output. This is called a von Neumann architecture from uh, another mathematician, von Neumann. So the main feature, as I said, is that the memory and the CPU are physically separate, but there is a problem because uh, when they are physically separate, then the CPU has to send the information data to the memory and the memory has to then send it back. So there is a, a latency or a limited uh, data transfer between the CPU and the memory. So this is uh, becoming really a bottleneck. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's known as a von Neumann bottleneck. And uh, uh, it slows down the whole process. So sometimes uh, in order to uh, uh, solve the problem, the CPU has to wait uh, for, or better, the memory has to wait for the CPU to do the computations. Uh, and, uh, and so before you actually finish the problem, uh, you, are, you have wasted uh, uh, some idle time by the, by the memory. This is not the only issue. In fact, uh, there is uh, another important uh, issue which uh, uh, you know, was mentioned before, and this is uh, uh, even more important than the von, von Neumann bottleneck, and it's uh, the energy costs. We are here around 2013, 2014, and so we actually use about uh, 500 ter terawatts per, ha per hour to actually do all sorts of uh, computations in the world. And as you can see, this is projected uh, to increase exponentially. And in fact, uh, 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 the cost of the machines themselves uh, stays uh, pretty constant, but uh, the amount of money that we will have to spend and the energy that will be consumed uh, in this type of uh, uh, process, uh, it's uh, huge. So it's unsustainable, in fact, to actually continue using these type of machines uh, uh, based on these type of architectures to actually um, solve all possible problems because of uh, energy and cost. So uh, what do we do then? If uh, this is uh, an issue, so we have uh, both uh, a time issue for normal bottleneck, an energy issue and money issue, what do we do? Well, we suggest to actually learn directly from nature. And in fact, uh, nature has created uh, the most uh, incredible computing machine that we actually carry on our uh, shoulders, uh, the brain itself. In fact, uh, the brain uh, operates uh, at very low energy. So it, it expands about 25 watts, performing 10 to the 16 operations per second. Now, if you want to compare this with the uh, von Neumann uh, architectures, uh, a supercomputer uh, would require 10 to the 8 watts to do exactly the same number of operations. We're not even talking about the, the abilities of the supercomputers because a supercomputer is not even close to the capability, massively, massive, uh, massive uh, uh, parallelism that uh, our brain um, um, affords or uh, can, can, uh, uh, can do. So uh, this is really an amazing machine because it operates at very low energy doing a massively parallel computation. So how, uh, what we want to do is like, actually uh, try to understand how the brain does. So what is the key or the keys for the brain to do this type of uh, uh, things and if we can emulate those in the solid state, so in, uh, in devices. So let's, uh, let's look at the physical properties of the brain. So the first one is that there is no separate CPU and memory in the brain. It actually computes and stores information on the same physical platform. So this is the first important feature of, of our own brain. Then it is a massively parallel, but a massive parallelism that is really impressive. So for example, I can look at the screen, moving my hands, talking, and at the same time I'm actually uh, uh, you know, uh, using a lot, I mean, uh, getting a lot of information and processing a lot of information at the same time. So it's a type of a, a massive parallelism analog that is not, uh, um, we are not capable to actually uh, even simulate with, uh, with our computers. Then he has uh, what we call polymorphism or functional polymorphism, which means that uh, it doesn't need to change the architecture to uh, perform different functions. So it, it just needs uh, different inputs and it will use the same architecture to actually perform the, uh, different functions. This is again something that our machines don't do uh, at all. 
So uh, our eye for, uh, eyes also have this type of uh, functional polymorphism. We actually change the input signal, and, but we don't change the eyes every time we change the, the, the image. And then there is an important uh, uh, point that I will actually uh, uh, explain in detail. We call information overhead, and it's uh, the following. In uh, computers like this one, uh, if I have uh, n uh, uh, memory um, units, uh, then uh, the amount of information I can store is proportional to the units uh, uh, themselves. But in the case of, uh, of the neurons uh, and uh, synapses that the brain has, uh, then we can store more information than the amount itself uh, uh, of neurons that we have in there. This is information overhead, so we, have more infor we can store more information than actually is the amount of uh, neurons uh, or um, units that you have in here. And the other thing, up to a certain amount, it self heals. So, so if, uh, if there is a, a damage, uh, and in fact uh, we uh, uh, change, or better, we, we uh, have uh, uh, neurons that die every day, but uh, it will, we will keep on uh, functioning, and this is a self-healing property. These machines that don't sustain uh, 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 damage, in fact, uh, uh, but the, the brain does. So we would like to actually do these type of things in the solid state. So in order to do this, I want to go to the details of a, a little bit of what, uh, what are the units that actually compute in our brain. And the units are the neurons, which are essentially cells, elongated cells, that collect signals from one side, and then the signal actually goes through what we call an axon, and then it is connected to other neurons through what we call synapses. So connections, the gaps between different neurons. The most important thing I would like you to uh, notice, though, is that at the surface of these uh, uh, neurons, uh, there are what we call uh, uh, ion channels that allow, actually, ions to go in and out uh, in a coordinated uh, fashion, and then the, the signal travels this way. First of all, I have to, uh, you have to notice that this is a ionic signal, it's not electronic. So, uh, in, some sense, uh, it's, uh, uh, in some sense, it is very slow. So, in fact, uh, uh, it's not completely clear, and I'll try to explain you later uh, uh, how uh, or we think the brain uh, uh, bypasses this uh, slow type of clock, uh, but we actually operate at a very slow rate, very slow uh, clock. So, these uh, channels open and close, and this is the key to actually create uh, the signals that then actually uh, we transmit uh, over this network. Now, if I go into more details uh, of this, if I look at the surface of these membranes and these channels that open and close, I, I can actually represent them with simple circuits. In fact, this was done a long time ago by Hodgkin and Huxley, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology for this uh, work. And apart from a capacitance uh, uh, of this uh, surface, and uh, uh, some battery-like uh, type of uh, systems that actually pump uh, uh, the ions in and out, then they actually wrote down uh, the uh, equations uh, regarding the resistances of these uh, uh, channels. In reality, at that time, they thought these resistances were simply nonlinear uh, uh, resistances, but we now know that actually they are more complicated than that. In fact, if you look in detail, and I won't go into the math in detail, these resistances depend on the amount of ions that actually flow in the, in the system, so they have uh, their own equations of motion. And without going into much detail, I can rewrite the whole thing in terms of the resistance, so voltage is proportional to the current that flows uh, from in and out uh, of the neurons, as a uh, uh, proportion to a resistance that depends on the current itself, but also on some internal variables, which are the densities of ions that you have, and these densities follow their own equations of motion. Now, these objects are not well, uh, simple nonlinear resistors, uh, but are what we now call memristors, or resistors with memory. They can actually store information on the resistance itself. What about the capacitance? In the original paper, they thought the capacitance was uh, fixed, but in reality, even the capacitance is a little bit more complicated than that, because if I actually uh, drive ions uh, across uh, a uh, nanopore like this one, ions will accumulate on one side and deplete on the other side. I show you here a simpler, a simpler version, actually we did this using molecular dynamics. If you actually apply a bias across this, so the ions will accumulate here and the ions of the opposite uh, uh, charge will accumulate on the other side. And if you now uh, reverse the bias, uh, you will have a delay 
in the, in the motion of these ions so due to the friction with the water and other uh, properties. And you can uh, simulate this uh, capacitance effect uh, as uh, uh, with the dielectric property that is uh, time dependent and depends on the polarization of the system. If you compute this capacitance, it actually has an interesting uh, 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 capacitance voltage uh, characteristic where it diverges and then it uh, goes to minus infinity, then it goes to a constant and, and so forth. So it's a non-trivial non capacitance, the one that we have uh, on the surface of neurons. And uh, the reason why it diverges is because uh, at certain uh, times you can have uh, uh, zero voltage uh, uh, while you have a finite charge uh, at a, um, of, the, of the ions uh, on the surface. And we call these things uh, memory capacitors because they actually can store information on the capacitance itself uh, on, the, on some degrees of freedom, in this particular case on the dielectric properties of the system. Now to tell you that this has been verified experimentally, so this was done, we predicted this in 2010 and it was actually uh, verified experimentally in 2011, so it's not uh, something that uh, is just uh, theoretical. Now, this is uh, actually one key feature, the fact that we can use uh, this type of dynamic capacitances with memory, uh, one key feature to actually transform uh, these uh, uh, brain-like uh, features into the solid state. In fact, the question then is, uh, can we reproduce uh, such a thing in the solid state in an easy uh, way? Well, uh, the answer is yes. If you take a, a capacitor, a usual capacitor, in between uh, you put uh, electrodes uh, where you have a tunneling between the internal electrodes but not between the uh, outmost uh, uh, electrode, internal electrode and the, and the external ones, then uh, if I apply a bias, uh, the internal charges uh, can tunnel through these uh, uh, layers and it will try to screen uh, uh, the, the, um, the external field. But clearly, if I do this uh, uh, too fast, or better, if I have uh, the external voltage uh, that moves or uh, changes uh, too fast, then the internal charges will not be able to follow this, uh, the, uh, this field. So you have now essentially a black box, your capacitor, with internally an epsilon that changes in time and can be modulated uh, enormously according to the tunneling that you actually have between the different layers. So if you actually simulate this thing, uh, you would have a charge and voltage uh, uh, on the external uh, uh, surfaces uh, that actually has this type of uh, uh, hysteresis curves, curve as a function of uh, the voltage that you apply, and again, uh, you would have uh, uh, the capacitance that diverges and becomes negative. So you can actually do this uh, in the solid state. In fact, uh, Toyota is now uh, uh, trying to do these type of things uh, for other reasons, but. Uh, but uh, it's something that is not difficult to make. Remember that you need just an insulator, uh, insulators uh, and metals in between, so it can be made uh, using uh, um, present technology. So in general, these things uh, uh, can be written in a much more uh, general form. So what I showed you are capacitors with memory and resistors with memory, but in reality, I can have uh, an input and an output and a response function that could be a resistance, capacitance, ductance, or anything, not just uh, uh, an electronic re uh, a response, that depends on the internal degrees of freedom that follow their own equation of motion and the input itself, and possibly even explicitly on time. And these, uh, uh, what I call X, are a set of state variables, uh, uh, for example, the, the polarization that I showed you before. Now, if I choose uh, for the input and output voltage and current, I have resistance, and this is what we call memristors. Leon, in fact, uh, gave the name a long time ago, although it was uh, known already uh, way before uh, that time, but the name uh, was actually coined at that in 71. And then uh, uh, we would have uh, memory capacitors if we had uh, charges and voltages and uh, we would have uh, memory inductors uh, if we had flux and current, but it's much more general than that because these things could be any type of uh, input and any type of output that depends on internal uh, degrees of freedom. Now, the interesting thing about these, uh, these objects is that they do show hysteres hysteresis according to the input that you put. You give, for example, here the charge on a capacitor versus voltage will show uh, hysteresis curves, and clearly if I have uh, a, a very low frequencies, then uh, the, internal charge, the internal state variables can follow easily the external uh, input, and so the hysteresis will shrink. If I have very high frequencies, uh, they cannot follow, it's too fast for them to follow the external 
uh, voltage, and so there will be no hysteresis. So there has to be a, a frequency uh, characteristic of the relaxation processes, uh, physical relaxation processes in the system, and at that frequency you would have uh, the largest, uh, um, the, the largest uh, hysteresis. So this is uh, the type of uh, systems that uh, uh, we uh, would like to use. Uh, remember that these are passive uh, uh, devices, uh, so, but they can store information uh, um, you know, in time. In fact, if a, a system like this, for example, if I stop here and it, it doesn't drift, the charger doesn't drift, then I have, uh, let's say, a zero here, and on this side I would have a one, and I can use it as a digital uh, element. But the most important thing is that these are actually analog objects, so I can use the entire curve uh, to do computation rather than just uh, the digital uh, um, aspect of it. I will show both type of, uh, of things. So, uh, I have now uh, the, uh, identified the three main features uh, uh, of the brain, massive parallelism, functional polymorphism, and information overhead. But there is uh, the, the key, in fact, uh, that is the memory. So the, uh, the memory of the brain, um, uh, in fact, uh, has to be key to the computation itself, uh, to do actually computation and storing of information on the same platform. I have identified uh, uh, elements that can do this type of uh, memory, so they can actually store information, and at the same time, they can actually uh, um, uh, be used to compute. And so, does this create uh, a completely new paradigm which is not Turing-like? Uh, so here is, uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, uh, this is a relatively new, I mean, we've been working for the past uh, two, three years, but we succeeding finally in uh, formalizing this, uh, this concept. I will introduce, in fact, uh, this new paradigm that we call universal man computing uh, machines, uh, and you will understand why it's uh, universal. So as I told you, this is the type of architecture we use in these computers. Uh, we don't want to do this. We want to completely eliminate the, uh, the part uh, uh, that separates the CPU from uh, the memory and put everything into the memory. And so we create uh, uh, what uh, we call a mem computing architecture where something, uh, some elements, whether uh, you know, memristors, mem capacitors, mem inductors, any element that can actually store information uh, um, uh, you know, at the same time as uh, computing, uh, does the whole thing. So we actually transfer the whole burden of computation into the memory, and that's what we call MEM processors of computational memory. Clearly, we would need, uh, uh, well, input and output, clearly, we would need uh, the control unit, which is not, however, a full-fledged CPU, because the control unit needs to tell the, the system what to do, right? It needs to tell the system what type of programs to execute, the same thing that you would have here. But we eliminated completely the arithmetic and logic units and transfer the memory directly uh, in, what we, uh, uh, in the processing part. Uh, so again, the control unit does not transfer uh, data, it just tells uh, the system to do whatever it has to do. So this type of uh, uh, architecture, in fact, is, uh, uh, defines a totally new class of uh, computing machines, and we call uh, universal and computing machines uh, objects that compute, in, uh, in simple terms, compute with and in memory. So they use the memory to compute and compute directly into the memory. Now, uh, uh, in, uh, clearly, you cannot just uh, say in words what it is. Uh, this thing can be formalized uh, analytically, similar to what Turing did in 1936. Uh, actually, we did it uh, uh, for this case. Uh, we have, in fact, a, a transition function that tells the machine what type of uh, functions uh, to operate on and the formal definition of this machine. You need this uh, in order to prove all the theorems that I uh, will tell you later. Uh, again, I will not go into the details. If you're interested in this, uh, uh, please take a look at this uh, paper because this is really a mathematical. Uh, um, you, need, you need to go through the math in detail. But what are the properties of these new machines that we uh, define? They are not Turing machines, so they are definitely not Turing machines. They're totally uh, different. But we have proved that they can simulate any Turing machine. So uh, if I take a, a machine like a, a, a UMM, which emulates what the brain does, well, it can simulate any Turing machine. Now, the, for the proof, again, I have to uh, uh, you know, send you to my paper because it's a mathematical proof. Uh, but the, the opposite uh, is not obvious. So can a Turing machine simulate one of these machines that, uh, that um, uh, do computation on the same physical platform? This is an open question. In fact, we don't know. 
And uh, uh, although I think it's uh, uh, very unlikely that uh, uh, a Turing machine cannot simulate a UMM, if that were true, we would be able to solve uh, some pro with UMMs uh, some problems like the halting problem that Turing machines cannot solve, which means we would violate the Church Turing hypothesis, and that would really be, uh, uh, you know, would uh, really be a major, major uh, um, uh, change in the in the way in which uh, complexity theory is defined. I think it's unlikely, but uh, uh, I have to admit uh, uh, we couldn't de uh, demonstrate uh, this thing because uh, the Turing machine uh, does not have the properties that I told you before, like especially information overhead and polymorphism that these machines uh, have. It's an open question. So uh, these machines uh, have the same exact properties uh, that the brain uh, has. So it has intrinsic parallelism. And it's, uh, uh, it comes from uh, the definitions themselves. So if I have uh, cells uh, like A, B, C, and D, all of them uh, operate at the same time. So the parallelism you have uh, in, uh, in our uh, computers, uh, even GPUs, it's a parallelism where the memory operates, uh, a CPU operates with its own memory, but then all of them, they have to communicate. And this, uh, again, does not solve uh, the latency problem that I told you before. Uh, this is not what we, I'm talking about. This is the type of parallelism I'm talking about. It means that if I have uh, N cells, <clears throat> they all at the same time operate on all the data at the same time. So this is uh, what we call massive, uh, uh, analog massive parallelism. And that's what the brain does, but not our uh, computers. And again, this uh, comes from the basic definition of these UMMs. Then we have uh, polymorphism, and this again comes from the definition of these uh, machines, which means that if I have uh, 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 certain cells, and according to the signal, let's say signal A, I, ha I do certain uh, uh, functions, I create some certain functions. If I uh, put in a, a signal B, I create something else. So I can actually do, uh, and I'll show you later an, a practical example of this, I can actually do all sorts of log uh, logic gates, all sorts of uh, operations, without ever changing the topology of the architecture, just the input signal uh, that, I, that I have. The last property, which is uh, a little bit uh, um, um, more, I mean, it's less uh, known uh, uh, for the brain itself, uh, is information overhead. And uh, uh, for this, uh, I need to, uh, to uh, just to give you a, a feeling of this. It was known in the community of neuroscience uh, that the brain uh, cannot just uh, simply store information proportional to the number of neurons. Uh, if, th if this were the case, uh, we probably would not have enough uh, memory to do everything we do. And so people uh, had the idea that uh, clearly if I have an, uh, n neurons connected with each other, the, the, the system does not, the brain does not store only you know, information on the synapses, but also the whole paths that go from uh, the different possible uh, uh, neurons. So it, it is a huge amount of information simply because the, uh, all the possible paths that go from one neuron to the other can be stored as well. So this is what I call information overhead. If I have, uh, let's say, n k cells, I don't store only the c different numbers, let's say, that are in each cell, but I can actually store their sum at any point in this, uh, in this uh, path. So this is the type of uh, feature that uh, uh, is very important to actually <clears throat> uh, reduce uh, the number of units you need to actually compute uh, uh, complicated problems. Now, the, uh, one of the amazing things uh, uh, that we actually proved analytically, for a formal proof uh, I uh, um, send you again to this paper, the, these uh, UMMs uh, solve uh, MP complete problems uh, in polynomial time. And the reason for this is because suppose you have uh, an MP, MP problem means that uh, uh, it can be solved in polynomial time by non-deterministic Turing machine. But if I had uh, a deterministic Turing machine, which is what we have here, the non-deterministic Turing machine is, exists only as a mathematical concept, it's not something that can be realized in practice. But uh, uh, an MP uh, problem has a, a tree, solution tree that grows exponentially with, uh, with uh, different uh, uh, paths. So a deterministic Turing machine would have to go through all possible paths uh, one by one and then uh, clearly uh, solve it in exponential time. But a UMM, a universal uh, MM computing machine, can actually do computations at every step in a massively parallel. So it can actually go from here to here in just one step. 
and from here to here in one step and so forth. So it just scales polynomially with the number of steps on the solution tree. Now, this without even information overhead, if I, if I do have information overhead, then we can show that uh, you can not, not only you can solve uh, and be complete problems in polynomial time, but you need just polynomial resources, which means that you need just a, a linear number of uh, uh, memory cells. You don't need to have an exponential number of cells to solve. And again, for the formal proof, I have to uh, send you to our paper. Now, uh, uh, for reasons that uh, I don't know why we, we didn't do it, at the beginning of, in this paper, we actually wrote that uh, uh, something, uh, uh, and then uh, we took it out, and I was sure the people would, uh, would, be, um, would complain. Now, the fact that we solve NP-complete problems does not mean that we have solved NP equal to P. So we actually received a lot of emails, interested, but some of them actually uh, worried that, that we got crazy. Uh, uh, we did not solve NP equal to P. NP equal to P means uh, uh, it can be solved only within the Turing paradigm. It cannot be solved if I have a, a totally different paradigm. So we have created a new paradigm that can solve uh, NP complete problems, but we did not show that the Turing machines can solve NP equal to P. If we did this, we would actually collect the one million dollar from the Clay Institute, right? Because that is uh, one of the major millennia pri prizes. So, uh, um, this is uh, an important point. Now, the question is, okay, uh, beautiful, you have now this new paradigm, but can you actually make it in practice? I'll give you two examples here. Uh, one is uh, uh, a famous uh, subset, uh, uh, the famous subset sum problem, which is one of the NP uh, complete, complete problems. So remember that if I solve one NP complete problem, then uh, I can solve all of them. There is a theorem uh, that tells you that you can actually solve uh, all of them, uh, all the NP-complete problems uh, together. By the way, we did not solve NP-hard problems because the NP-hard problems uh, have uh, solution trees that grow even super exponential, so uh, uh, factorially, for example, and so uh, maybe the UMMs uh, can reduce the complexity from super exponential to exponential, but that we haven't proved. So what is the subset sum problem? Well, it's uh, simply you take uh, uh, n numbers and you ask the question, uh, uh, is there a subset of those numbers that uh, uh, will sum to some number, let's say zero or one or whatever. This is uh, an empty complete problem. Again, a, a deterministic Turing machine would uh, uh, require an exponential time to, to solve it. A non-deterministic Turing machine, which it does not exist, uh, requires only polynomial time. Now, we came up with a simple uh, algorithm. So you take uh, this function that actually uh, creates, uh, uh, it's a product of, uh, of uh, uh, exponentials uh, in complex plane with uh, these uh, AJs are the numbers that you uh, have in your system. And then you Fourier transform uh, uh, the, uh, that uh, function and the Fourier transform will give you all possible uh, sums of all possible uh, uh, elements in this uh, in this uh, uh, set. Now, uh, we proved uh, that this indeed uh, uh, solve, uh, solves uh, this problem. We proved it uh, uh, on software, so we actually implemented uh, this thing. Here are the solutions uh, of uh, the subset problem for all possible. Here, I think we use the 27 numbers, and it gives you, uh, for each uh, point uh, in uh, red here, you have uh, uh, three solutions, for example, or uh, ten solutions, and so forth. To make sure that we actually had the solutions, we compared uh, with the dynamic programming, which is uh, the fastest, uh, as far as we know, type of uh, problem, which are the dots. And so you see that uh, in, uh, in uh, implementation, this, this uh, simple algorithm does give you the, the solution. But remember that in imp implemented in, uh, uh, in uh, software, this is not, uh, um, does not, uh, um, scale, does not scale ex um, polynomially, clearly, because if we did define an algorithm that scales polynomially, again, we would have solved the NP equal to P. But uh, if I, I can implement this in hardware, and that's where uh, this thing does actually solve uh, this NP complete problem, actually in one step. So in, uh, in, uh, uh, we know that this algorithm uh, solves it, so what type of hardware can, uh, can do this? Without going into too much details, uh, uh, you, you have, uh, we, uh, we call these complex voltage multipliers, essentially they create uh, this function that I told you before, 
and then uh, they uh, couple together, they will give you all part, the solution uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this problem in essentially one step. So they actually uh, do this, and that's what uh, this uh, hardware does. By the way, you can actually do it in any undergraduate uh, uh, electronics lab, so it can be made uh, uh, quite easily. It's uh, not passive, so these elements uh, require active uh, uh, components, but nonetheless, it's a hardware implementation of the subset problem that can be solved in one step. And in fact, uh, what you need then is a band pass filter, so essentially signal analyzer, band, fil band pass filter, fast Fourier transform, and that's it. By the way, notice that the band pass filter limits the bandwidth, and so you don't have uh, to uh, uh, look at an infinite amount of uh, points, and, uh, and so you can actually uh, um, do this in one step, so without uh, infinite resources. So we actually found a, a, an actual hardware uh, representation of this, uh, this object, of a UMM, that solves an NP-complete problem in polynomial uh, time. Now, this is not a, uh, a general purpose machine, so can we actually do better than that? And in fact, it's very simple. You take the DRAM that we have in these computers, take out the capacitors that uh, uh, we use for storing in there, and replace them with the MEM capacitors I told you at the beginning, where you have, uh, you know, the, let's say, the high dielectric and low dielectric uh, uh, insulators uh, between metals, and you have the same type of architecture with, uh, uh, um, with the same, uh, exactly, the same type of architecture as a DRAM, uh, with beat line and word lines, but this thing, without going into too much details, can do actually polymorphic logic. So I just need to change, here are two cells, and I just change the voltages of, uh, uh, on these two cells, and I have a region where I can actually show analytically uh, that this is a complete set of uh, uh, logic functions. So I have all the possible logic functions without ever changing the architecture of the, of the system. And by the way, this operates uh, uh, also uh, in a massively parallel way. Since it uses uh, MEM capacitors, it also uses a femtojoule, one, uh, about one femtojoule per operation. So it's really uh, uh, cheap in terms of energy. And the reason is because uh, these are capacitors, memory capacitors. So uh, the energy that I use for computing does not, is not spent completely into the operations. It can be reused. Uh, uh, after uh, part of the computation. So this is, uh, uh, so I showed you uh, the, this new type of uh, paradigm. Uh, I showed you two examples, so there are more, but uh, just two examples. One that solves an NP-complete problem in uh, one step in hardware. Uh, then a, a general purpose machine that actually can do analog, uh, both uh, digital, by the way, this can be, uh, uh, can do digital, as I showed, or clearly analog computation. Uh, but what do we learn from this, or what, what is next? Well, I would like to learn from these uh, UMMs uh, how actually the brain uh, uh, works, or better, uh, can we learn something from the fact that the brain uses memory uh, um, in terms of, uh, of the, its uh, workings? So in this respect, uh, uh, I want to uh, go back to the point I was making at the beginning, which is, uh, uh, remember that we use ions to compute, and uh, we are very slow, so, uh, we, we don't actually process a very fast information. In fact, if you do a simple calculation, it is important that we are slow in terms of clock uh, uh, rate, and the reason is because we do about 10 to the 16 operations per second, and uh, if we had a very high rate frequency, then we would uh, need a huge amount of energy to actually do it. So the 25 uh, uh, watts that I told you at the beginning come precisely from the fact that we operate essentially at hertz, not at gigahertz. But so how in the world that we are so fast? So for example, people uh, uh, can react uh, very fast. Uh, uh, a typical example is a tennis player that can react to a tennis ball coming at 100 miles an hour uh, in fractions of a second and while the ions move much slower, right? So uh, people think, and this is an hypothesis, that uh, uh, the following thing happens. If you do uh, uh, FMR, functional MRI on, uh, on the brain, uh, and then you look at uh, the correlations between different uh, neurons that fire on the different parts of the, of the cerebral uh, cortex, then uh, uh, these correlations actually decay with the power law. So uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, a neuron that is located, let's say, uh, here, 
close to the visual uh, uh, cortex, can actually uh, connect uh, very easily to a neuron that is uh, uh, centimeters away, okay? Because a, a system that has a power law correlations, uh, we know in physics uh, that a little bit of perturbation can be transferred uh, at infinity because the correlation function is uh, uh, infinite. Now, in fact, in physics, we know a simple model we call Ising model that actually shows the correlation between uh, spins in this case. And you see that at the critical uh, value, so when you have a phase transition, then uh, the Ising model shows the same type uh, of behavior as the brain. Below uh, uh, criticality, you, you are not, you don't have this type of uh, um, scale behavior, and above criticality also. So the, in some sense, the brain has to operate at a particular state, we call in physics a critical state, like a phase transition, and uh, the reason uh, uh, could be, and this is again a hypothesis, because uh, uh, neurons are very far very far from each other can actually uh, talk to each other quite efficiently if they are at this, uh, uh, at this critical state. So uh, where does this uh, type of uh, criticality uh, uh, come from? So what generates this thing? So what we think uh, is uh, uh, the memory generates this uh, the memory, which means the time non locality in the system generates this type of uh, uh, behavior. So can we uh, emulate it uh, uh, in simple terms? So here we took advantage of uh, another uh, uh, system, of ants, uh, colonies of ants, that uh, in order to find food right, from their nest, how do they do it? They actually go around, send out uh, uh, ants, explorers, and uh, the first one that finds it then uh, uh, retraces uh, a trail left by itself, and these are trails of pheromones. All of them leave pheromones, and this is a memory, so essentially it's a this pheromone decays in time, and it, uh, uh, when they retrace it, uh, the, they reinforce uh, the, the trace, and so the shortest one gets reinforced uh, uh, much better, because if another one finds it, but it's uh, too long, the memory uh, fades uh, uh, faster uh, um, than in this case, and so even if this one was found, it's too long, and so the other ones will reinforce the short, uh, shortest one. So what is uh, the key here uh, in these colonies? You have a collective behavior, you have an N ants, so you don't have one that does this, and you have time non locality, you have memory. So all of them uh, uh, operate in a massively parallel way, and they leave the traces in time to actually uh, retrace uh, the shortest path. This is an optimization problem that is very difficult to solve, but the ants do it, and all uh, uh, colonies uh, in nature do it uh, quite efficiently. So the key is uh, massively parallel uh, uh, computation and memory. So we simulated this uh, uh, creating a model, I won't go into the details, but it's essentially like an ant model where you actually start with ants, you send them out, uh, you give them memory, and then you let the, the network grow. And the simulation is actually very interesting because uh, without memory, if I start with a network uh, uh, without memory, then it will become essentially random. So all the uh, nodes will uh, 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 correlate with each other in a random way. But if I have memory, so if I have a time non locality, the end result is a network that actually scales with the power law. So the correlation between different uh, uh, elements of the network scales as a power law. Now, the memory is the key here. And in fact, uh, uh, you, don't, you need uh, a specific type of memory. You cannot have uh, an infinite memory and uh, if you have an infinite memory, the network will not show scale-free properties, so uh, power laws. If you have no memory, it will not show either. So you have to have a, a specific uh, intermediate type of memory. Here you should look at these uh, uh, traces where you have this type of uh, uh, behavior. And this is similar also in the case of, uh, of the ants. Suppose the ants had an infinite memory, well then all the paths would be equivalent. And so uh, they will not find efficiently the, the, the shortest path. If uh, the memory uh, would decay too fast, faster than the average distance time it would take to go from the food to the source, they will not uh, find it, right? So you, they need to have uh, an intermediate uh, uh, memory uh, like uh, uh, the brain. So our brain also has to operate uh, with an intermediate level of memory. Not too much, but not too little, okay? And the last things uh, uh, that I wanted to show are the self-healing properties when, uh, when damaged, and this is again a property of the memory. 
So uh, here I take it as an example the, the ant uh, uh, situation. You probably did it when you were a kid, so that once the ants have created their own uh, uh, trail to find the food, and uh, 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 you, know, you want to disrupt them, like uh, you break uh, the, uh, at some point, uh, you, know, you bother them, I used to, uh, they will immediately look for uh, all the paths, right? But the shortest one gets reinforced almost immediately through the memory. In this case, the memory of the, of the pheromones. So in this, this object, this collective colony, uh, is self-healing. So it will self-heal, it will uh, uh, refine the shortest path, and will self-reorganize into the shortest path. And the memory is again the key. Here I have a network of uh, memoristors in this case, memory resistors. I have uh, the shortest path between the entrance and the exit uh, here, two points. I break it and then the, the system will refine uh, in a self-organized manner the, the, the path. Okay? So the memory itself uh, is, uh, is a source of healing uh, and self-organization in the system. So, I think I'm, uh, I'm almost done with this. I wanted to conclude, so I, uh, I showed you <clears throat> a new paradigm of computing we call universal main computing uh, machines because they actually uh, can simulate uh, any universal Turing machine, although we haven't proved uh, the opposite uh, and it would be nice uh, to do it. It's not a, a hypothetical one. In fact, uh, it can be made uh, with uh, available technologies. I showed you two examples. Uh, this one is uh, passive, it uses uh, passive devices. The one that solves the NP uh, uh, complete problems, upset some problem, uses uh, active devices, but it can be uh, done uh, in any uh, electronics lab. And uh, uh, clearly there is a huge market uh, potential for this type of uh, uh, technology. It is massively parallel, polymorphic, uh, and it, it is, uh, uses information overhead, so you can actually store more information than the number of elements that you have here. But uh, I hope I convince you that uh, uh, this can teach us a lot, in fact, uh, about how the brain works. And this ties in to, uh, in the US, we have uh, the brain initiative here. You have uh, uh, another initiative. Uh, um, ours is actually um, uh, smaller in size. Uh, but the brain initiative precisely wants to uh, um, map the, the brain topology and understand from there uh, what type of features we can learn from the topology itself. And so with this, uh, I just uh, uh, acknowledge uh, uh, you saw many names. Uh, in fact, this is uh, my group over the years. I've uh, worked with uh, fantastic uh, students and postdocs. The, the two really that uh, uh, are the main players in the, in the things that I told you are Yuri Pershing, who's now a professor, as I said, in South Carolina, and Fabio Traversa, uh, who's uh, uh, the Polytechnic of Torino, but he's uh, looking for a permanent job. And uh, also I had uh, uh, the pleasure of working with uh, experimentalists like Dimitri Basov and my uh, um, University, Alyosha Hamma uh, at Perimeter Institute, Francesco Caravelli at uh, the Ox Oxford, Oxford University. With this, I, I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max, for your wonderful presentation. We have time for some questions. Lazo, please. Doing computation. So doing computation uh, in practice with memory stores has failed because of the large dispersion in individual device characteristics. So the threshold field to switch varies a lot. Do you face similar problem here with your capacity? Uh, we, uh, okay, uh, if you use uh, mem capacitors, you wouldn't have that issue. If uh, you want to use, you see, the, the, the thing is that people want to use uh, memory stores uh, to do the usual logic. So they want to reproduce uh, uh, Turing machines. What we are suggesting here is a totally different type of paradigm. And so uh, in that paradigm, uh, in fact, you don't use a digital. You, see? you don't need a threshold, uh, a large or small, and so, and so forth. You use uh, the whole features of the system, whether it's a memory system, a capacitor, whatever. So if you, again, if you want to use it for logic, I think you're better off with memory capacitors for several reasons, including the fact that they expand very little energy. In the case of memory stores, once you, uh, you drive the current, all the energy is gone, right? In the memory capacitors, you can recycle part of the energy. 
But uh, I, uh, uh, I argue that we should change, uh, completely move away from the Turing paradigm of phenomenal architectures uh, to something totally different like the one that I showed because these are really powerful machines that are very similar to what the brain does and they can do, uh, they can solve in, uh, problems like NP-complete problems really in, uh, in polynomial time. And so you, you cannot do this uh, with these type of machines. Yes, please. I'm just wondering about error correction with a mem, because I'm imagining that you're going to have this accumulation of analog errors in a massively parallel way, and um, so how would, how would that work? Well, that's, a, that's a, the thing. In the, in the, if you do it uh, in analog, uh, uh, then the error, uh, the error correction is not needed, uh, essentially, because you can solve, for example, the subset sum problem that I told you, it's in one step. Now, if you want to use uh, this in digital, you may have issues with uh, uh, error corrections, and that requires uh, uh, probably, will require probably some correction. So it depends on what, uh, what you want to do. If you want to use it in analog, which is a massively parallel, then uh, uh, there you don't need uh, uh, error correction, uh, if, especially if you do it in polynomial time. If uh, you use it uh, in digital, yes, then you will have uh, the usual, uh, you will need the usual error correction uh, on top. But this is a, a, a control unit uh, uh, issue, right? So you have to control through the unit, uh, you have to control the error of the execution. There's a question. It's a related que question, actually. Uh, can you comment on the role of noise, actually, in breaking correlations and, and so on? How does the operation have to be with respect to the noise floor? Yeah, so again, um, in the case of analog, it's not, a, it's not a problem. I mean, let me show you here, for example. Um, the, the reason is that the memory self-organizes the, the, the computation. So suppose you are solving a subset sum problem, right? And uh, you have noise or errors in the, in the, in the system. Well doesn't matter because the system will refine the optimal part, path thanks to the memory. If I'm using it like ants do it or like our brain does it. If you're using it as a digital, then you're, you risk to have those issues. In fact, uh, I, I think we should move away from that in, in this respect because uh, uh, self-healing properties are not a digital thing, uh, are an analog thing, you see what I'm saying? Uh, and so if you use it as a digital, I agree with you, you have to uh, be careful. So the noise uh, will affect, uh, uh, um, according also to the cycle that you use, the clock cycle that you use, it will affect uh, uh, the competition. But if you use it in analog mode, uh, uh, then it's not an issue. You take advantage fully of the self-healing properties of the system. Quite interesting, and uh, I want to ask about the okay. Our von Neumann type computers, it is not the brain type, but we can solve a lot of problems for computer and so forth. So, your proposed brain computers, okay, can solve a new problem which the von Neumann type cannot solve in polynomial time. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, but, all the NP no, complete uh, problems uh, <laughs> cannot be solved uh, uh, in polynomial time yeah, by yeah. our machines, right? But we have so many public computers. Sure. Okay? Then we can solve it. No. No, no, no. no. no, no. no, no. Uh, unlimited. No, no, unlimited. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, well, then, uh, if you give me an infinite uh, universe uh, with an infinite amount of uh, computers, yes. Well, that, uh, well, that is not feasible, right? So if you want to, if you want to solve uh, an MP complete problem in a reasonable uh, uh, age, right, before we all die and the universe dies, then you cannot do it even with the parallel machines. And the reason is because I think I showed, uh, um, let me see if I can get it real quick, but uh, uh, this is the main reason. Uh, suppose you want to solve an MP complete problem uh, with our machines. I'm oh, sorry, I got the wrong one. This one. Yeah. Uh, you don't have this type of parallelism which means that all the units at the same time compute and store on the platform. 
the, the, even if I use uh, GPU or the supercomputers, the best ones we have in Japan or in the US, they all have uh, local memories, uh, close by memories, uh, that uh, uh, take uh, parts of the data and try to solve that, and all of them uh, uh, um, solve parts of the program, but then they have to communicate. So that is a major uh, bottleneck uh, in terms of, uh, of computing with these things. So uh, any problem NP-complete, uh, if it is uh, NP-complete uh, for a single CPU, it is NP-complete uh, also for N CPUs. Now, you can argue, and this is uh, mathematics, you can argue that you have an infinite amount of those, but uh, that doesn't solve the actual issues, you know what I'm saying? So uh, it's, a still, it's still an NP-complete problem. How do you deal with the issue of time? In typical circuits, you have frequency, you drive it. And you, right. And then the, and the issue, of course, of real time as well, because you have applications where you have deadlines. Uh, what do you do about it? Right, so uh, the time issue comes uh, on the type of problem that you're solving, right? And it is all in the control unit. This is uh, similar to what we have in our control units for this thing. So. Suppose I want to use this uh, uh, in the digital mode, then the control unit would have to set the time for execution. If I want to use it in analog, again, uh, the control unit will have to tell the time. So the time enters uh, in the control unit. Remember, the control unit uh, cannot be eliminated. So the control unit uh, uh, is uh, the one that decides what type of execution and what type of problem needs to be solved. That cannot be eliminated, but it's not an arithmetic unit. It doesn't transfer data between uh, a memory and a CPU. It's uh, the part of the CPU that uh, we can never eliminate. And you know, our brain must use some type of control unit, right? Uh, so so uh, this one is the one that decides it, both at the real time and the execution time. OK, then I would like to. Do you have a question? I would have a question myself. Sure. It's, uh, you've, you've been presenting a new computing paradigm which basically focuses on the problems that the current one cannot solve. But still, in the computer science domain, we have a problem with the current paradigm in the sense that there is more and more software that we have difficulties to control, to verify, so that to be sure that it does what it's supposed to do. What is your feeling about this new par paradigm in terms of providing the tools to check that what you would be programming on top of it would be possible to verify? Uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um... I think that if, he, uh, if uh, the checks you are talking about, in fact, uh, uh, also scale sometimes exponentially, right? So I wonder if uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, problems that could actually be used as a side uh, help, let's say, uh, to the usual one. Yeah, I can envision that, although I never uh, really thought about it uh, specifically. But since they can solve the NP-complete problem, which means uh, uh, exponential uh, solution trees in polynomial time, I can envision the ta this type of, uh, of um, uh, help. Yeah, it's uh, conceivable, yeah. Because especially the, the point is that they could verify themselves. That's right, in some sense, yes. Well, Max, I would like to thank you for your thank wonderful you. speech. Thank and you. I would like to wish you a very good stay here in Lausanne and in Switzerland. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you, Nani. Thank you. Thank you.